Hey everybody, welcome to the wonderful world of Remnant Radio. Today I've got Michael Roundtree and Dr. J.P. Morlin on the other line. We're going to be discussing miracles from J.P.'s book, Experiencing Miracles. It's going to be a great show. You guys stay tuned. You are watching The Remnant Radio, a crowd-funded show where we interview pastors, teachers, historians, and theologians from different churches and denominations. My name is Joshua Lewis, and this is my co-host, Michael Roundtree. Together, we want to help you break outside of your theological echo chambers. If you're interested in learning about history, theology, or the gifts of the Spirit, this is the show for you. Well, the episode is recorded, but man, it doesn't really matter because there is just so much just prophetic energy on this episode as today we are filming on February 2nd of 2022. That's right. We're 2222, two, 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 even though we may be releasing this at a different date. There's still, I don't want to say magical prophetic energy, because then I just, I'm going full fledged mocking, and that's not at all what I want to do. Uh, just jesting, just joking, obviously, uh, uh, just uh, picking fun at some of the, the prophetic language we like to embellish things with. Uh, but you are watching The Remnant Radio. I want to remind you before we dive into our subject today, we're an entirely crowdfunded ministry. Uh, if you'd like to support the ministry, there are links in the description. Uh, you can give there on PayPal or Patreon. You can go as low as five bucks a month on Patreon. And you get access to extra content. Like when we film our live Q&A on Patreon, we upload those videos. We've got a two-hour live Q&A uh, that was just released on Patreon. And uh, we've got other content like interviews with Elijah Stevens, Stephen Bancars, and many others extended content there that can be found. So as low as, low as five bucks a month, you get access to that content. Uh, or you can give one-time gifts there on Patreon. Without further ado, I want to introduce you uh, to my good friend, Michael, who's living all the way over there in Oklahoma. Michael? How are you doing? Or as you like to say, the the Oakley homies. What, Oklahoma what do you call homies. It? That's right. Oklahoma homies. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Well, uh, cool. Uh, excited to film this episode. And you guys need to check out JP Moreland's book. JP is with us. Again, came with us. It's called Experiencing Miracles. And uh, JP was with us in, uh, I guess it was November. And Josh and I were so just enthralled by the stories in this book. And of course, it's really, it's got the intellectual side, it has the scriptural side, and it has the storytelling side. Great book. And we just had a fascinating conversation. If you didn't see our last conversation with JP, and JP, I seem to remember that you you had some sort of like eye surgery just before something. It looks like that's all healed up now. Uh, well, I guess you could address uh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go I've ahead. I've got a bandage there, but it's doing better. Okay. Pre PTL. Uh, stands for praise the Lord. Don't know if you guys yes, knew I that. <laughs> so anyway, you guys need to check Michael's out. Michael's real hip with all the lingo from the kids I'm, of the youth. And, uh, and he, so he PTLs. Hip. Okay. So I actually, I got to tell you guys a quick story on that. Uh, one time, you know, Josh, he's so much more up on these things. I, I think part of it's the, the fact that Josh is like 13 years old. But um, Still Josh, have more gray hair. Yeah, there you go. So I came to I came to Josh, and you, you remember this, Josh? And I was like, dude, uh, I I found out like there's this thing where YouTubers get together with other like well known YouTubers, and they do this thing called a collab. Have you heard of a collab? And Josh was like, Yeah, I, I've heard of a my collab, exact bro. words were yes, Grandpa Roundtree. I've heard of a collab. <laughs> that, that is exactly, exactly, what exactly, <laughs> exactly what you said. That's exactly what you said. So uh, anyway. <laughs> Back to the episode, um, man, check out the last episode we did. Hit that subscribe and like button so you don't miss these kinds of episodes. Check out JP's book. Uh, you can find it on Amazon. And uh, and then JP, we want to just hear from you a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your, uh, your ministry and how we can connect with you. And then we want to jump into the subject of miracles. Well, I uh, am a professor at Talbot School of Theology at Biola University. And um, I also have, uh, I'm the director of a, a center called IDOS Christian Center, and I speak and write, and uh, I have a website. I don't do much with it, to be honest with you. I still have a rotary phone, and um, no, I'm kidding about that, but I'm not, I'm not very <laughs> It's kind of tragic when you have to tell somebody that was a joke. But you know. uh, I was still Googling what's a rotary phone. I was like, what? <laughs> you, know, you know what Mark Twain said about jokes? He said, if you have to dissect it, it's already dead. <laughs> I love but Mark you know Twain. what? I, I, thought it, I thought it was funny. <laughs> okay. So you were talking about how we can connect with you and some of the things oh, that you're well, doing. 
I have a website, but it, I don't do much with it. But there are some articles on there people might want to look at. So, jpmoreland.com. Excellent. Yes. Hey, JP, let me ask you this. You know, you're you're an apologist. Primarily, what you do is you you make defenses for the Christian faith. You teach on this. Uh, you're an expert in this field. Uh, and as we go through these kinds of miracle stories, what? How should a believer view these things? Like, what measure of authority should we place on these experiences? Uh, should they just be there to build our faith and trust in Jesus? Should these things be used in an apologetic manner to win friends and family? When they start to hear some of the stories that we're talking about today, what category would you want people to be thinking about miracles in? Yes. Well, uh, all of the above, but let's address your— sp they are tremendously encouraging— in building believers faith and building their courage so that's 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 very important but i think in terms of the apologetic value um i i would distinguish uh most of the miracles that we'll talk about from private religious experiences because most of these miracles are publicly attestable events so they're they're observable and uh so I think that if a person is already kind of open to God, uh, I think one of these stories or two or three of them are almost impossible to explain away. And they, they will have an impact. Now, th there are some people that are still hung up with a God question, and you might need to do a little spade work there before you'd go to a miracle story, but I do think they have a proper place in the apologetic task. Okay. Well, maybe a follow-up to that JP would be, and, and by the way, I'm calling you JP because you tell us to call you JP. I would otherwise call you Dr. Mo Moreland, Please. but um, I want to make sure his so, dad who's watching knows that he's very polite. <laughs> he just wants to make sure he's, he doesn't get in trouble later. <laughs> Thanks, it's Josh. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm Grandpa Roundtree, so that's right. it's, I just it's kind of a generational thing, Josh. But um, so I wanted to follow up though on that question. So Matthew chapter seven, uh, you know, some of you will say to me in that day, "Did we not prophesy in your name? Do we not cast out demons and perform many miracles in in your name?" Uh, it seems as though by implication, Judas probably performed miracles alongside the apostles. And of course, you can go to the Old Testament and you can see um, you can see the Egyptian sorcerers are able to perform some miracles. And so um, somebody might push back and say, uh, well, JP, uh, if unbelievers can perform miracles, too, if even, you know, the devil could supposedly perform miracles, how does this point us to the God of the Bible and to Jesus Christ? Well, I think the first say? thing, yeah, good, good question. I think the first thing that I would say would be that I don't think that the scriptural teachings that you cited uh, in any way entail the, the fact that the, 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 the number and quality of the miracles that God performs will be duplicated uh, by those that are not in the faith. I think that there will be uh, prophetic words and uh, counterfeit miracles that are, uh, that are supernatural, but I don't think they rise to the level of just the overt uh, quantity and quality that you would expect to see from the from those who are Jesus followers, so that that's the first thing. I think the second thing is that Jonathan Edwards said that what you the the, the real test is is the fruit that uh, uh, this uh, these miracles produce in the life of those that are involved. Uh, are they drawing people to Christ? Are they causing them to want to be obedient? Is it building their love and faith for, for Jesus, or is it drawing them off on a tangent? And is it ultimately being destructive and confusing? So I think that that's why you have to, you have to place everything under the authority of Scripture, uh, or, or you're just left in a sea of uh, speculation. Uh, so that would be the second thing. And then the third thing I would say would be what kind of can you discern the reputation that a person who's making this claim has in, in his or her local church, 
uh, among the people that know this individual? Have they had a track record of faithful service? So that's the character test. And, uh, and then I think you uh, step out and you tell the Lord that uh, you're going to lean toward uh, trusting the ambiguous ones as opposed to leaning toward skepticism. Uh, and you're asking God if that's a mistake in a case, I'm trusting in you to, to, to cover me and protect me from the mistake. So th that's my approach to it. Uh, that last point might not be shared by everybody. Okay, that's good. If I had to summarize those, would that be doctrine, character, discernment? Would that be the way that you characterize those? And I would. And uh, discernment yes, being I, broad. Yeah, no, I would. Uh, very much so. And the fruit, the character of the person. Um, by the way, one comment. Um, I, I, in my own life, I, I don't want to be unduly skeptical or unduly gullible. And so I've tried mm -hmm. to strike a balance that, that I would hopefully call approaching wisdom. And, and so I've made the decision that if there is a case that is, I, it go, it could go either way. Uh, and I just can't decide on it. I'm not, I'm not going to base anything important on that because it's too ambiguous, but I have decided that I would rather err on the side of believing something than being a little bit skeptical because I know God exists and I already know Christianity is true for, for a range of reasons. And so I'm going to, that has justified me in leaning toward erring on the side of belief rather than on the side of unbelief in those cases where they're not clearly one way or the other. Okay. So we've got That's this. Good this formula of doctrine, character, discernment that we can kind of look at these miracle stories through. And I think I'd like to ask you to tell us one of these stories that we can kind of look at yeah. and examine oh, with these great. kinds of parameters. Um, you mentioned that these things were attested um, by communities. So you're not talking about private personal experiences, but communal no. uh, witnesses. Right. So in the same way that, you know, the scriptures appeal to, hey, we know the resurrection happened because there were 500 witnesses, right? We exactly. know that this happened You can in the go upper and talk room. to them. Yeah. Yeah, there's 120 people in the upper room. He, he appeals to living people that you can you can go and put your hands on still. So, uh oh, I'd love to do that. I'd love to examine some of these corporate stories and and run them through this kind of diagnostic. Let's do it. Um the important thing for people to know is that I'm I'm I put my reputation on the line in these stories because I like I said, I carefully vetted them. I called people, uh, I contacted the individuals and, and queried them very with very rigorous questions. I got other witnesses. So let's let so let's let's do that. Um, uh, there was an occasion uh, um, um, ten years ago or so uh, where a a Jewish woman had cancer and she had undergone radiation and chemotherapy, but this cancer spread to over 51 points throughout her whole body. Her body was literally riddled with cancer, and she was at the point where the, her oncologist uh, abandoned, uh, committed her to hospice care, which is what you do when people are terminally ill, and it helps them depart mo with more comfort. So there was as far as the medical community was concerned, her doctors had, had, had told her that she was now beyond help. They'd done what they could. Well, she had a friend. She was a Jewish woman, and she had a friend who uh, knew about uh, a, a, a prayer room at our church. Uh, there were people on Monday night could come and receive prayer. And she said, I know that you're not you're Jewish, but look, what do you got to lose? Why don't you go and see what happens? So she came on a mon on three Monday nights in a row, and the and and the first two Monday nights there was a small team of people, I think four or five, that took her into a room and prayed over her. I know two of the individuals, and I first uh, er heard about this by uh, interviewing both of them. And on the first two Monday nights, nothing happened, uh, but she felt so loved on and so cared for that she wanted to come back, uh, and so she came back the third. Monday. By her own testimony, she began when prayer took place to feel this hot oil-like experience 
which is what a lot of people share when they are experiencing a healing, but it poured down from the top of her head, down all throughout her body to her, to her feet. And she, at that moment, intuitively sensed a, a shifting in her body and had the intuitive uh, confidence that she had been healed. Now, that didn't count for a lot. Counted for a little bit, but so what she did is to tell everybody, I think this is true. And they said, You need to check this out with your oncologist. And so the next morning, she called her oncologist and said, I know that you've committed me to hospice care, but something has happened inside of me, and I'll pay out of my own pocket if I have to, but I need another scan to see what's going on. So the doctor fitted her in that week. And a, a day or two later, she went and Got, got scanned and the doctor came out of the scan with his jaw on the floor and said, I really don't mm. know how to, how to tell you this, but not only do you have no cancer anywhere in your body, but there's no evidence you ever did, but I know you did because wow. he brought out both plates and here is the plate that we took of you. And you can see if you count them, there are 51 highly lit places that are cancerous and this one is completely clear. And I know we didn't mess this scan up. So I can't, I don't know what wow. to tell you. Something has happened to you. Well, the woman gave her life to Jesus and became yes. a messianic Jew. Now, four years later, five years later, I think it was, I was invited to be on PBS and uh, to be a part of a, a, a presentation where they were interviewing top atheists around North America and Europe and Christian theists on, on what, on what to make of miracles. And so I wanted to share this story. So I contacted one of the guys that had testified to this. And I said, can you give me your email? And so he did, I emailed uh, this lady and uh, her name's in the book. And I said, look, you don't know me. And I told her that I'm going on the show. Here is what uh, these two guys told me. And I laid out everything I've told you. And I said, would you just respond to me and tell me if this happened or not? Well, I, she, I got an email from her and I've got, it, I've got it saved right here. She said, not only did everything you say happen to me and I gave my life to Jesus, but I have been clear of cancer for five years now. Not, it has never come wow. back. Yeah. And I am still attending a Messianic uh, Jewish congregation and i am in love with with jesus and i am Amen. so to spreading his gospel well that's that's one story in the book and it received confirmation from two people that i know well and uh also from the lady herself that didn't know me and had nothing to gain by trying to get 15 minutes of fame with me she didn't know who I, anything about me so that that's the story. Yeah. Amen. I love that. I love that. Well, you know, of course, there are some people that they're going to want to push back. Well, yeah, sure. A random miracle happens every now and then. But why doesn't this happen more? But there were a couple of parts that that stuck out to the story, story to me. And I think uh, significantly, she didn't stop after that first Monday night that she went in for prayer. She went again. And then she didn't stop. Then she went again. And I just yeah. think of James 4.2. You have not because you ask not. And so to the person who says, I never see miracles, I never see healing, I want to say, how often do you pray for it? Luke 18, 1, Jesus says, always pray and never give up. And so it's just, it's fascinating to me that the Lord had full power to heal her the very first time she came to pray, and he didn't. And he also didn't right. do it the second time. He did it the third time. Um, and, and so I... And, and according to Luke 18, 1, that's actually evidence that there is faith, the fact that we persevere in prayer. And if we're not persevering in prayer, oftentimes that's an evidence of not faith. Now, I'm not making light of those difficult cases. I have certain things that I've been praying for for more than a decade. But uh, I, I'm simply saying as a general rule, I, I see this here that a lot of the people uh, who criticize miracles are the uh, and and the fact that God never performs them... Um, are, are not actually it's an doing argument what from Jesus experience. Says. 
we need to do right. in order to experience more, for, more of them, first of all. And then second of all, there's loads and loads of evidence that there are lots of miracles around the world. Go check out Craig Keener's two volume uh, uh, yeah. set of documented miracles. Uh, do, okay, you but you were about to say something, JP, so I want to let you say it. Well, if you do check out Keener's two volume set, be sure that you are, uh, you, you are ready to get hernia surgery because that thing is way so much. <laughs> It's hernia inducing. <laughs> well, what I would say, number one, you're right. Uh, you, you've been hanging around with the wrong crowd or something. But here's what you need to do. In the first chapter of the book, A Simple Guide to Experience Miracles, I list eight things you can do to help you become more expectant of, of the supernatural. And one of them is when you get together with your Christian friends or you uh, gather and Sunday school or a, or a house church or whatever, start asking people this question. Have you ever had an experience in, let's say, the last six months or the last year that was either an answer to prayer or a healing or having God speak to you and guide you or you sense the presence of an angel or demon uh, that, that you, is beyond any reasonable doubt in your mind that it couldn't be a coincidence and that God had to do it. And you will be shocked at, the, at what will come out of people's mouths. And so the assumption that God is never doing anything is just patently false because I go into churches and ask people, how many of you have had a specific answer to prayer that was a miracle? 85%. How many of you know somebody that was specifically healed? 70%. Blah, 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 blah. But we just don't talk about it in this culture mm -hmm. and we don't know what's going on, though it's going on all around us. But people are embarrassed to come across like they're being too spiritual or bragging or they're in the in the goofy stuff. And uh, so they mm -hmm. don't talk about it. Well, so we've got to start making this a part of our witnessing because the, the bear, it's not just preaching the gospel. To bear witness is to testify about what you have seen and heard. God Amen. do. And this Amen. is a part of missing. That's that's a yeah. key thing. And 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 when you lift his books, you've got to lift with your legs, right? Not <laughs> not with because you will get a herniated disc. You really Dude, you gotta I love lift that with you your have legs. those books on you right now. So it's these these are Keener's enough. books on the miracles, the documentation <laughs> stuff. This is it's nuts. But uh the, the, just a joke, just a joke. But, but um, hey, they don't happen. They don't happen. They don't Gosh. happen though. So let me let me ask you some questions. Let's run this through that gambit doctrine. You know, discernment. It wasn't a personal, private experience. It was a public thing. Fruit. So fruit is easy. She gave her life to Jesus, right? So and, as you're telling the story, I'm like, okay, she's religiously Jewish. So like doctrinally, like she's not doctrinally sound. So can a miracle obviously happen to a person that isn't doctrinally sound? Um, you know, so that would be a question in that that discernment piece. Uh, personal, private experience. She experienced the oil. Now, though that is subjective, you would say, okay, she felt warm oil, but you even said in your story, that's kind of an irrelevant part of the story, the verifiable fact that she was actually healed and, and cancer was no longer found in her body. How long was the, uh, the event of her testing for cancer and then her, you know, miraculous retesting uh, when it was gone? I'd be interested in that if you have that information. Yeah, and then also- was and, and finally, like, final, final question, is this documentation, like, um, do, do you have any medical documentation? Because I'll link it up in the show. People can look at it. Because it's things like that. They go, show me the x-ray. Show me, like, the real skeptic wants to know, where is the stuff? I'll, I'll link it if you've got it. Yeah, I did not feel a need to go and visit this doctor and, and look at the, It is medically documented. And her oncologist has the plates. And, she, and, and there's a file on her that he kept and they don't throw those things away so there's no doubt about it but i didn't feel a need to go check on that because i think that is overly skeptical uh the the information that i have verified puts it beyond any reasonable doubt that this happened this just was a miracle and uh the fact that i didn't verify the medical documentation doesn't imply that you can't do that but I didn't sense a need to do it because uh, th th this woman uh, was, was, was healed. She, there's no question she had cancer. And five years later, she's been cancer-free, and she's still walking yeah. with 
this. And she said herself that this is what her doctor told her. And I think that her eyewitness testimony is sufficient in this particular case. And by the way, remember that um, it is not just the improbability of an event happened that indicates it's not an accident or a coincidence. It's also the fact that there's something special about that outcome, mm -hmm. independent of the fact that it happened. And, and so, for example, if, if it was exactly what people were praying about and this highly improbable event happens, when you put those two together, uh, that is beyond scientists use that principle and say it's beyond reasonable doubt that what this event was produced by an act of a free rational agent. Now, in this case, God would be that agent. But so no, I, I did not investigate the medical documentation. Yeah, no, that, uh, not to that's worry, good. Not to worry. And, and that, and what, that, what would you, that formula what, that you put out there, uh, go ahead, Josh. No, I was just going to say, what would you say about uh, the, the doctrinal implication that the miracle was happening to a person that didn't have orthodox doctrine? Um, and well, again, I think me and Michael would yeah. have an answer for that, but I'd be curious your thoughts. Yeah, good. good. I, I think that um, uh, if you look at the, the book of Acts and if you look at uh, the early church history, uh, uh, you see one of the things that is a part of evangelism is that he is healing someone that then leads that they come to Jesus after they're healed. So healing is a part of evangelism, and uh, it, it has been practiced, uh, you know, through, throughout church history. Tertullian, for example, uh, there uh, in the second and the two hundreds, he was a church father, and they're they're starting to be persecuted by the local Roman governor. I think his name is Scapula, and we have uh, we have records of a let two letters that he wrote to him. One of them, he addresses him and says, "Listen." Um, why would you want to persecute Christians? Because we're the ones that heal your sick citizens and deliver them from demons. We're, we're doing good. And who, if we don't do this, who else will do it? Now, you don't, if you're writing to a local governor who has the power to, to, to execute you, you don't appeal to something that didn't happen. No uh, doubt. To, him to back <laughs> off because he's going to look at that letter and say, kill those suckers. I mean, they're just a bunch of liars and they're, I don't want them in there. Well, obviously Tertullian was assuming that this governor knew about what they were doing. And, and, and so th this was, uh, this is real evidence that unbelieving people were being healed by them because it, he did not say they were all believers uh, and so on. So, by, by the way, there's a thing that I need to mention that's really important. Um, <clears throat> we are put into the world, and one of our tasks is to be knowers. Okay, now, by the time we die, we want to know as many things as we can. So, uh, what, the way to do that is just to believe everything you ever hear. And if you just believe everything you ever hear, you will end up, I can guarantee you, believing, at least believing more things, more truths than you would by any other strategy. The problem with that is you're going to believe a lot of falsehoods. Well, what if your desire is to not believe any falsehoods? The way you can do that is never believe anything, be a complete skeptic, and that would be the best strategy in life to avoid believing anything false. The problem is that if you adopt the strategy of, of believing everything you hear, you will have more truths than anybody else that you believe. The problem is you will also believe a lot of falsehoods. Now take the skeptic. The skeptic who is unduly skeptic will protect himself from avoid, uh, believing falsehoods at the price of failing to believe important truths. Because if you just are skeptical, uh, you, there are a lot of things that are true that if you would lower your skepticism and be more balanced, that you would believe that could be helpful to you. So th there is, in our culture, it is said that you're, more, you're smarter if you doubt things. I've never seen an argument for that. There, I don't, I don't know that there's a good mm -hmm. argument. It's just 
It's a cultural assertion. The problem with it is that if you adopt that approach to life, you're going to end up missing out on a lot of things that are true that could have helped you. So you don't want to be over the people who say, well, do you have medical documentation of that? No. Well, then then I don't want to listen to you. They're idiots because they, they, do, if, do they actually of everything they believe, do they require precise scientific documentation? If they did, our entire jury system would evaporate overnight because decisions are made, and rightly so, about guilt and innocence based upon circumstantial evidence, eyewitness testimony. Sometimes uh, DNA is involved, but not most of the time it isn't. So are you telling me that you can't decide rightly that this is a good investment, this house, as opposed to that house, unless you've got medical, uh, some kind of doc scientific documentation for it, dude, you're going to, you're going to have a pretty lean life if, if that's what you require. And I think that's mm. just, I think it's silly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that's a good point. You, you know, being that you're a philosopher yourself, it makes me think of another philosopher from a few hundred years ago in France, Blaise Pascal, more mathematician, but philosopher, theologian. Yeah. He kind of, he was a jack of all trades, but he had this quote. He said that, uh, I'm paraphrasing here. I've always remembered it, but he says, uh, there's always enough light for those who want to believe and enough shadow for those who don't. There and you go. I, I really like that because I, I think it speaks into this particular miracle story. You're saying, I personally know two people that prayed for this woman who came in for prayer three nights in a row. Uh, her doctor's testifying to it. This community is testifying to it. She herself changed religions based upon it and it turns out she's alive I, I mean you're looking at it and you're saying if that's if there's not enough light in that for you to believe then me going and spending hours of my time to go drive to some hospital somewhere and meet this person's doctor is really not going to convince you because you've set a standard up of uh, your skepticism has set up a standard that's actually impossible for anything to meet. So you're going to stand back with your arms crossed your entire life and just say, I don't believe. And, or you're going to stick your hands in your ears and cover your eyes. And, and at some point you just have to use your eyes and your ears and, and, um, and, and exercise faith. And, and the reality is you're exercising faith either way. <laughs> you're either well, exercising faith. I believe that the evidence points to, um, to this being a miracle and that it being supernatural and that it being God, or I believe the evidence points the other way. At the end of the day, all of us, skeptics or otherwise, are making a decision based upon what we believe regarding certain facts. Yes. Yeah, so yeah, the the these eyewitnesses, I have I, I have known both those guys for, for 19 years. And they and leader activists and and uh, uh, praying for the sick in the church every Sunday for 19. They just, it's a, it's their ministry. And now I have watched these guys. I have had, I've been in their homes. I know their marriages. I know their kids. I know their, their, I know the kinds of people they are and they have reputations of high integrity in the church. Uh, that, it, it, that's the gospel truth. And, and when mm -hmm. those guys that I know who are, so used to doing this that they rejoice, of course, but they've seen so much. It's not like, oh, my gosh, another. It's, it's kind of what they expect. And uh, having somebody like that bear witness is much different than me interviewing somebody that I've never heard of or whatever. I know these guys mm -hmm. and their, yeah. public, their character is public knowledge in the church. You know, you know what? So that, and, that, and JP. Yeah, and, and I just want to say, JP, on your behalf, I'm offended that Josh asked you for medical documentation. Wow. I mean, the nerve of this guy. Wow. It's really hey, no, it's, it's, it's under my skin, it's, Josh. How stupid he is. I know. I know. <laughs> I, earlier in the show. Okay, so it, I, I would I would like to ask a follow-up to that because I I I would agree with you, like in a court of law, um, you are going to have sufficient evidence. Um, from uh, eyewitness testimonies, um, from maybe, maybe maybe you don't have the murder weapon, uh, but you have the circumstances, you have the motive, you have you have all of these different pieces that are sufficient to condemn a person. Uh, that being said, uh, 
I, I also want to live in this space where as Christians, uh, if we're going to live in the place of prosecution um, or defense, our goal is to accumulate as much pieces of data as possible to make yeah. our case for us. So yep. to your point, I would say it is sufficient um, to have eyewitness testimonies, to have a life conversion, to have these kinds of different things. It is sufficient for the testimony alone. I would just say for the church that's out there and you saw the tumor fall off, go pay for the, the, the documentation. Go go get the doctor, spend whatever is required to get the person retested uh, so that you can have so much more evidence. It's not that your testimony isn't enough. It's that you want to be able to provide as, you know, my buddy Elijah Stevens put that documentary together, you know, send proof. And that's one of the things that many charismatics haven't, we're telling um, testimony stories like we're in the 1940s still, you know what I mean? And to have the kind of medical documentation is worthy of an apologetic for those who are atheists and those who are skeptic. Um, their threshold for evidence might be higher than is necessary, uh, but to show them an insurmountable amount of evidence and for them still to turn and say, hey, uh, I'd rather worship the created thing rather than the creator. Well, great, that's on you. But I've done everything in my power to give you the evidence as God has provided to me. You would, you would still affirm something such as that as well. Like it, it's not an either or, it's a both and, right? Oh, well, absolutely would affirm it. In fact, there are uh, uh, stories in the book where there uh, that that medical uh uh, attestation is is public knowledge, and uh, it, I, I was able to discern uh, where it was attested. And uh, there were a couple of uh, stories from a journal, a uh, medical journal, that uh, had detailed studies of two cases that were even the doctors themselves said were miraculous healings, and they gave all what happened in the case and signed off on it in a medical journal. And so there was medical Praise attestation God. to that and, and to some of the other stories as well. So I'm with mm -hmm. you. I think we should accumulate as much evidence as we can from a variety of sources, documentation. Let's get more to people that saw it and interview a larger number of uh and see if they, you know, contradict each other or what have you. So I'm with you on that. Yeah, that's good. Well, uh, Josh had just mentioned Elijah Stevens, uh, whom I know that you uh, you also know, uh, JP, because he's the one who originally connected us. Um, Elijah was just on the Unbelievable podcast with Dr. Craig Keener, as well as Michael Shermer. I don't know whether he's a doctor Solid or not, program. but I do, I do know that Shermer is the head of, is it the Skeptic Society? I think so. That's right. Um <clears throat> Anyway, and they had a debate about these kinds of things. And one of the things that Shermer said uh, from the position of skeptic is, hey, you know what? I hear Christians talking about I got a headache healed. I, you know, my toe hurt, you know, these kind of things. They get healed. And occasionally you get a big one like cancer, whatever, but maybe it's not invisible and hard for us to really know and attest to. He said, what I don't hear a lot of is I don't ever hear a Christian talking about you know, my amputated limb grew back because I sought, you know, the Lord and and prayed. And uh, I, I don't see these sort of creative miracles. And uh, and so, JP, I, I would like to just hear your response. One, what would you say to it philosophically, the objection that, well, we don't get these um, creative sorts of miracles, maybe what Shermer would classify as, as sort of easier miracles, if we could even call, call it that. Uh, so number one, why is that, if that's even true? And number two, do you have a story that refutes it? Yeah, I'd say three things. Uh, the first one in the book, I provide a, a five or six point, if I may just be honest with you, devastating refutation of the view that Shermer holds that underlies this, this uh, claim. Shermer holds that extraordinary e e claims require extraordinary evidence to back them up. And I show that that is, has been refuted decisively by a secular philosopher of physics, who John Ehrman, who wrote a book called Hume's Abject Failure and showed that that claim that an extraordinary event requires extra extraordinary evidence is, is just plain false and irrational. 
And he and I give reasons why that's true. So Shermer is still parading the same uh, uh, level of evidence requirement that has been decisively refuted uh, by an atheist on his own side. Uh, and I, I, I'm getting tired of, of atheists using the same old baloney when they've been they don't they are not responding to the refutations and i've got a solid a list of uh arguments against that view in finding uh the book uh, uh a simple guide to experience miracles the second thing i would say is that because miracles of a cl of class a don't happen it it doesn't follow that miracles of other categories either both don't happen or that it's irrational to believe in them because he, you know, he hand waves over at cancer healings, but you know, they're invisible. We can't see. Well, I just shared a story with you where it wasn't invisible. They've had x-ray, they had rays or whatever the scan was they used. And there are healings where uh, that uh, I have, I have talked to missionaries who've seen uh, a, 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 an entire uh uh, baseball sized uh, uh, sore on the skin of a woman's stomach over in Ethiopia disappear in front of their eyes at the command to go away in Jesus name. And I, I could say, I know 10 or 15 stories from people who have seen that very sort of thing happen. Tissue uh, disappearing uh, Charles Kraft shared with uh, me and two other Talbot professors, this is back when he was at uh, Fuller, uh, that uh, th to make a long story short, uh, he, the, the, the dean at Talbot's son was a missionary in, I think, Brazil, and he came home with his wife to, to, to visit, but, but the little boy they had had a flat was flat on the side of his head. Uh, there was an internal canal, but there was no ear. His head was flat, and he had to try to hear through the skin. And so they asked Kraft to pray for this boy, and he didn't want to do it because he didn't think anything had happened. So he laid hands on his head, on the side of his head, and prayed that his that an ear would form, and nothing happened. And so this the dean and this this family drove to Applebee's to to have lunch and the little guy gets out of the car and blood is running down the side of his head and an ear stub had grown on the side of his head. And it hmm. was enough for them to go to Boston and to have plastic <laughs> surgery done to, so that they could put an artificial ear on this significant stub, a hole had formed, but, skin had grown out with, with, that was cartilage-like that would hold a plastic ear. It didn't grow out entirely, but it was visible, and this little boy uh, could immediately hear because he began to respond to things that his parents were saying. Um, wow. And there are cases... That's so bizarre. Well, it is. It's, and, and so I'm and, like, well, God, if you could do that, why didn't you just do it all the way? And I don't think any well, of us can enter the mind of God on that, but what we can well, say is that your two like highly improbable and special circumstances they prayed for it that was met so it was we can't necessarily enter the mind of god and say why didn't you do it all the way yourself but what we can say is that's a miracle well and not only that uh michael but i called i uh, i called another fuller professor uh that has a really great reputation and I, he was, uh, he was older, but he was there at the time. And I said, I, I got a question. And I told him what Kraft said. I said, do you know anything about that? And he said, oh my gosh, uh, I, I, it absolutely happened. In fact, I talked to the, I talked to the Dean right after it happened. And he told me the whole story himself. And um, I, I, the Dean had retired and I, I tried to get a hold of him and but he'd moved to Pennsylvania and I couldn't get his number. But I had two independent professors that told me the same story independently mm. of each other. And that was sufficient for me. I don't, these, these guys aren't going to make this up in my opinion. Maybe you can say they did. And I, I don't have a response to that, but 
Uh, and there are other accounts of where uh, a tissue has grown, grown back. Uh, um, uh, and and uh, Jim, Jim Rutz has a book uh, uh, that is, and I forgot the name of it right now, uh, but it's about miracles that have happened around the world. And I went to his house in Colorado Springs on three occasions to press him about the authenticity of the, of his sources. And I was convinced that, that the book contained genuine accounts by the, by the way he answered my questions. And there are photo, there's a photograph in there of some person who had uh, a, a part of a hand grow back uh, before people's eyes or the whole hand. I don't remember right now. So it's not true that this isn't happening. It does happen. But I, it hap it's it's in a minority. Mm -hmm. uh, but but and I don't know. It's God, irrelevant. I don't know God's mind. But does that does it, are you telling me? And I'll say yeah, exactly. I'll say this. Are you telling me that because there are none or very few of these that what happened to uh, Susan Senegan, the, uh, the blind Jewish or uh, the Jewish woman isn't a miracle? Uh, talk to me about that. How do you explain that? I want. I will go back to that. We had a blind guy in the church, and I and I I I know the guys who were there. One of them was an optometrist assistant. I know four of the people that were on this team. They gave the names of the couple in their home, and the the, the husband had a grenade, a grenade. He jumped in front of his uh, 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 his uh, sergeant in a uh, in Vietnam War, and a and, and a grenade went off to save his life. And shrapnel put, hit his eye and put his eye out. And it looked like a piece of marble over the years because this was like 20 years later. And they went up there uh, to have a conference up in Northern California, this five groups from our church. And the, the, this couple invited them over to pray for him. And they prayed over him for 20 minutes. And his eye was restored to normal. It no longer looked like marble. It, would, it was alive, oh. blood was flowing in it and he could see he closed his other eye and they held fingers up in front of him and he got it right uh wow. and uh i know that and, and they that, prayed and they prayed 20 minutes right they didn't pray they didn't 30 pray seconds an hour or you know they well, well right they but what i was saying is there was actually some level of perseverance in that that they really kind of the soaked in this prayer they so but, but go ahead eye. i want to let you finish your thought no, they did soak his eye. They laid hands on him and they spoke against it and prayed over him for at least 20 minutes. And wow. uh, there's, I can tell you more about it, but that's, uh, what do you do with that? Yeah, let me, I mm. mean, the, the story about the, the kid, I mean, that, that story is quite eerie. Sorry, I've been waiting for you to oh. say that joke without interrupting oh. anybody. Okay, I apologize. Okay, but, oh, dude, but the that one, was so good. sorry, I'm Give sorry. I, was, I really required a lot of self-control not to interrupt anyone. Man, to Josh, that, that was a new lobe. I, I appreciate that. Uh, okay, so uh, you see what I did. So, so uh, yeah, you mentioned again the twenty minutes. How many of these stories, you know, with the one, the woman, the Jewish woman, uh, the the young man, or not the young man, the 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 gentleman who was in Vietnam? How many of these stories took time? Like the prayers weren't instantaneous. Rise and walk in the name of Jesus. But how many of these? Like the, the through, okay, I prayed three times or they came back, right? You think of the, the, the story of the man who was blind and, you know, Jesus prays for him and he, he sees men in his trees walking and Jesus prays again. Like how many of these were kind of progressive sorts of miracles? Like uh, I wonder if the reason we don't see miracles is we've created a paradigm in which I will pray a 15 second microwave prayer. And if nothing happens, I'll just assume it's not God's will. When there might necessarily, I mean, with the, most of the stories you've given, there seems to have been some kind of perseverance in that prayer. No doubt, absolutely, and I think a lot of them are that way. Uh, and I and I give in the book the reason why one prays longer, uh, because there are two different ways of praying, and one of them involves directing God's power on something while you're praying. It's based on Moses' hands being lifted during the battle. But when his hands went down, Israel began to lose. That's not a silly story. What it illustrates is that sometimes God's power is directed on a situation by our 
humble cooperation with him. And when we stop that humble cooperation, the power is cut off like turning off a, a flashlight. And I think that, that one way to look at the, the importance of soaking is to see it as an opportunity to be to kind of bathe it and to focus the power of God on that and cook it and rather than just asking him. They're both legitimate forms of prayer, but I would say a number of them. Wow. Can I tell you another story? Please. Please do. Please. Yeah. Yeah. This, is, this is a real favorite one of mine uh, because it shows, in my view, how much Jesus loves to reward people who serve him. And he loves, he loves us equally, but he just does that. And this comes from a couple that have been in the church that I go to for 30 years. We went to Israel with them, uh, hoping I see them every Sunday, and they are godly people. They're just constantly doing help feeding the poor. They're out there ministering uh, and, and sacrificing themselves. And these people, like I said, I'm not, they have, if you came to my church and asked about the Hendersons, uh, what are they like? They have a huge, humble-hearted servant reputation in the church. They're just dear, quiet folks that just do, do the stuff and they don't talk about it. Well, so um, June's parents were had been on the mission field in among hispanic speaking people uh in south america for 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 decades in fact she was born on the mission field but then eventually came to college to the states well their parents were a part of a missions organization where they were working among the poor his, in, the, in the hispanic community and and helping them and planning churches they did not uh, have a, 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 a 401k. They didn't have a retirement set up. So they retired and they, they came back to the States. And I think this happened about 20 years ago or, or, or something like that. And they moved into an apartment uh, down near San Diego. And after being there for about a year, the, the wife had been living in small conditions her whole life. And she, she told her husband she would really like to have a, a house that she could live in that was their own. And they were pretty naive about house, the housing market. So they invited June and Bill and the rest of their siblings to pray for them, that God would provide and lead them to a house that they could move into because she was a, an elementary school teacher and he was uh, helping plant Hispanic churches in the San Diego area for no pay. So they were not making much uh, and uh, they had virtually very little saved up, but they, they, a realtor took them around and there was one house after they'd visited a few where they were able to go inside because the people had moved out of the house about a couple of months earlier and it was open. So they went in and they, they looked around the house and the wife absolutely fell in love with this house and said, I, I, I want, we want this house. And the realtor said, okay, well, how much can you put down? And, uh, and, and they cited a number of something like $2,000. And she said, oh, my, my you're going to need 10 times that. Uh, you, you need at least $20,000. The house is uh, $250,000 back in those days. And uh, the monthly payment, if you, if you put you know, that much down, is going to be with, with taxes somewhere around $900,000. Nine, a little below uh, a thousand uh, uh, dollars a month. Well, they were heartbroken because they knew they couldn't get the house. But, but at the, and they were there for thirty minutes. That, that wasn't long. A knock came at the door uh, while they were getting ready to leave the house, and the realtor went to the door. And there were two men there, and they were not Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, but. Uh, and these so there was no bike present. Is what you're saying? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, that's right. And, and so uh, the, 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 this one gentleman said to the realtor, is the owner here? And she said, well, um, uh, these people are thinking about getting the house, uh, but they'd already kind of decided that it wasn't possible. She said, would you like to talk to them? I said, yes, please. So they came up and this guy said to them, listen, we're, we're with a cell phone company and we're, we're knocking on doors here. Uh, and we, and we, we came to your house, uh, and we want to put two cell phone towers in your backyard. But before you say no, just hear me out. We will make them look like palm trees. So they won't be noticeable unless you really examine them closely. And we will, we will give you uh, an initial amount of money of something like, I don't remember, 20,000, 10, it, it matched what they needed. And for the next 30 years, we will give you uh, $10,000 a year for 30 years. And it was, it, it, it gave them the down payment. It, it paid for their, their, uh, their rent, the, uh, their payments to the bank. And they had money to spare. Now, what happened is that the, fa the the wife died about seven years ago. And just this last year, the husband, the, the, the father died. But he had lived in that house with his wife all this time up until now. And it was paid off a long time ago. And uh, that was a way that God honored this dear couple who couldn't. Now, what are the chances that this team of people would show up while they were at the house because they were only there for a while. What it was, they June told me it was about a half hour, but they happened to show up during that time and they solved the problem by giving them the down payment and uh, paid for the house for 30 years, which they didn't need to do because it was a 25 year loan. And it, it was unbelievable. And so, uh, I consider that to be a miracle. Okay. So it, when we look at the categories of highly improbable, it definitely meets that and special circumstances, I guess that they prayed for this to happen or what would you put yeah, as the they, special? They prayed that God would uh, provide a house for them. That, that was just the right one. When they went into the house, they immediately said, this is the one we want. We want mm -hmm. this house. And they told the realtor that, and then they found out the bad news. So it was the fact mm -hmm. that they this was this house was what they they asked God to, to to lead them to a place that they would recognize that they wanted. That happened, and that's what made this house special, as opposed to the others they looked at, which they didn't weren't interested in. And then this guy yeah. shows up, and they get it. So you it it, it satisfies the the filter. Okay. Well, that's good. Well, JP, we're coming to that time in the show where we'd like to just kind of summarize our thoughts, see if there's any closing nugget that you want to leave. Uh, and Josh, I'll just uh, volley it first over to you. Uh, is there just one takeaway that you would like for our guests to have? Uh, Josh, what would, what would you like our guests, to, our guests, our viewers to walk away with? Yeah, if you guys are watching right now and you're listening to Miracle Testimonies, uh, and maybe this is your first time hearing uh, miracle testimonies, whether non-Christian or Christian, uh, but just have been in the space of Christendom that denies that these things are still ongoing. Uh, I would just ask you to honestly consider the evidence. Uh, do your best job to uh, honestly look at the stories, look at the testimonies, look at these accounts and ask the question, what is more probable that a group of people who believe in Jesus, that profess uh, the death, burial, and resurrection, that these individuals um, are telling stories uh, that uh, of things that have entirely changed their lives, being able to hear, converting their faith, uh, in many ways, I would assume, has actually hurt their relationship with their families as they're coming into Christian faith, that they've made sacrifices, that these people are demonically inspired, uh, that these stories are falsehoods, or that they're actually 
counting the cost because of these interactions that took place in their life. If you're in that kind of uh, uh, cessationist community who didn't believe that these things happened, or, or maybe uh, you're in a, uh, a space where man, you just don't believe miracles are, uh, th that they exist, maybe you're a non-Christian, I'd encourage you to look at the evidence, examine these things, and see if they would hold up in a court of law. And then ask yourself, what's more probable, uh, that these things just accidentally happen spontaneously uh, when we know that there's a uniformity in the laws of nature or uh, that maybe there was some kind of divine intervention with these situations. As Christians, we want to be Christians who aren't untethered from intellectualism. Uh, we want to be uh, uh, love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Do you like how I counted my third finger twice? Um, uh, you know, as I talk about anti-intellectualism. Uh, and those... And those <laughs> Heart, mind, soul, and strength. This guy can't right even count. I don't even well, believe in anything he it says. Even, hey, you don't need no factual data. I'll tell you what. So <laughs> I, I would say look look into these things because I think it's it's more probable that there was some kind of divine intervention than something spontaneously happened that was mysterious. Uh, I think we live in a, yeah. a, a magical world, and I think many of us know that, but we don't really know how that affects you know day-to-day -day life. And, and I, think, I think Christ is the answer to this. JP, what are your yeah. what are your closing thoughts? I couldn't have said it better, and I I I think that a simple guide to experience miracles would be a, a place that you could start. I, I think it's a pretty objectively written, it's evidentially based, and and you make up your own mind. But but don't let this go. Look into it and 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 investigate because you may be missing out on something that is your birthright as a Christian. Amen. That's good. Hey, uh, JP, is the book you were looking for by James Rutz, is it called Mega Shift? Yes. Mega Shift, The Reality of Worldwide Miracles. So if you guys were looking for that book, uh, is it a book you would recommend to JP? You were talking about it. Yeah. Is, uh, having, yeah. uh, okay. having investigated uh, Jim, and his, I don't agree with everything he says in some of his other books, but in that book, I, I'm confident that these stories are real. I've, I've investigated him and I've investigated the sources that he used and they are, they are recognized to be credible missionary sources. Yeah. And okay. before you pick well, up Jim's book and before you pick up Keener's book, pick up right, pick right up here, guys. Moreland's book right here. You got to pick up experiencing Moore. miracles. Okay. And this yeah. is a simple guide to experiencing miracles. Not just, not just experiencing not, miracles. Not a part of simple, it's easy. Josh, just experience, it's, it's experience simple. miracles. It's a, it's a simple okay. way. I'm gonna say. <laughs> okay, guys, uh, make sure you like, subscribe, uh, share this channel with your friends, talk to them about it. We want to get the word and the message out there and uh, take this one, share it with your friends who may be a little on the skeptical side. And, uh, and so thank you so much for joining us today. We will see you next time on Remnant Radio. God bless.